Hi, everyone. I can't even tell if there's anybody there. Um, my name is Rachel Pollack. This is my Open Millinery Studio stream, and I'm going to try to sign on to uh, the YouTube channel for this stream on this tablet because um, the last time that I did this, I couldn't see what was happening in the chat because I have really poor eyesight and the text was just too small. Um, so if you're here, can you drop a comment in the chat to let me know uh, where you're tuning into the stream from? I was recently featured in a email newsletter for Hat Talk Magazine, which is an international millinery magazine. And um, I, I'm a little bit overwhelmed at the response. I got 150 subscribers in the last 24 hours. So <laughs> that was wonderful, um, but also uh, a little bit intimidating. So uh, I'm having difficulties with my Streamlab software yet again. Um, I can't seem to get it to connect to YouTube. Um, so the pre-scheduled stream link that I think probably most people have clicked on and are waiting for that to start is not going to start. Um, so I had to start a new, I had to open a new live chat through just directly through YouTube, which is fine. Um, but it does mean I probably have some audience members that are in the other stream or, you know, are signed onto the other stream waiting for me to show up and I am just not there. So um, actually, maybe I should um, see if my moderator is in the Discord, uh, which is, uh, her name's Mickey Marvel. She taught this wonderful um, workshop on live streaming for artists that I took that is great. Um, let me quickly say, That the stream is not connecting. Um, I had to start a new one. So that way, if um, I'm not sure that she's going to sign on, um, but just in case, oh, here she is. Hello, hello again. I just messaged you on Discord. Yes. Um, <laughs> So, um, well, Mickey, let me ask you then, because I had scheduled a stream and then I publicized this so widely and got featured in that article. And I, I feel like maybe I have a certain number of audience members that are on that stream waiting for it to start. And it's not going to start because I can't get the software to talk to YouTube. So should I delete that stream or uh, like I couldn't get it up and running at all? So I don't know, um, well, I guess I can just start this stream going, um, start working and um, I, but I don't know if I have any audience at all or if they're all attached to the other one. <laughs> anyway, I guess I will just start working and hopefully people will sign on. Um, and I think I will delete that other, um, delete that other uh, stream link just so that if anybody is there, they won't be just sitting around waiting. Um, oh, the live chat is running for that one though. Hmm. Well, Nikki, if you are still on the chat for, for the scheduled stream, that's not going to actually happen. Could you, because I don't seem to be able to chat in that window, um, if you could just drop a note that says, uh, come on over to this new stream. Oh, hi, Athena. <laughs> it's good to see you. Um, so I'm having technical difficulties, which is no surprise because they were really bad last week too. Um, you could totally delete that other one. 
Um, okay, great. Maybe people will just come over here. Um, Athena is one of my uh, graduate students, so that is super exciting. Athena, Mickey Marvel was uh, the woman who taught the workshop I took on streaming for artists, and um, she is also the one who assured me that live streams uh, would suck the first few times, and in fact, they have, but they've also been really good. Um, let me try to um, connect with my tablet here because my eyesight is such that it is, if I could see the chat here closer to me, um, that would be helpful. Um, open millinery studio stream. No, no, come on. This was such a nightmare. <laughs> I had it all set up and everything, and then it just um, imploded on me. So, so be it. Um, wow, I can't figure out how to... You know what? Forget it. I don't want to waste any more time on that. Um, this is something I will negotiate the next time and figure out. It's a great idea, uh, but it's not working in practice. So... Let's just get started. Welcome to the Open Studio stream. Um, I have, I don't have a counter for how many people might be watching at any given time, um, but I suspect that there are a substantial number of people because my channel was featured this week or this month in the most recent uh, monthly email newsletter for a magazine called Hat Talk, which is an e-magazine that is published by um, some milliners in the UK, but read worldwide. And I was a little flummoxed because uh, I, I didn't, I knew they were interested in um, featuring the channel in the newsletter. I didn't know it was coming yesterday. And it's been sort of a flurry of excitement because I've had almost 150 subscribers to my channel in a day, which is a little, which is exciting. Don't get me wrong, it's exciting. But it's also a little intimidating because, <laughs> um, the readership of Hat Talk is uh, contemporary professional milliners across the world. So um, I am, I know because they've subscribed and commented and such that, that they're a very educated bunch about this topic. Um, I'm a theatrical milliner. I started this stream so that my uh, graduate students would have the opportunity to to witness me working in the studio since uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has occurred. Um, and our theater had to close down, uh, cancel the rest of its season, and now they're doing just a virtual online season of streamed live, live readings and such. There's not as much call for costumes, and even the ones that we are providing to them, we can't have a team of 14 people packed into the costume shop and maintain safety uh, practices. So we're working staggered shifts, and anyone that doesn't absolutely have to come in, is encouraged to work from home. And so ordinarily I'd be working alongside my students and they would see hats like this go from raw materials to a completed hat. And that, I have a cat, his name is Riley. He just came into the room um, and I'm gonna try to keep him from jumping up here, but he likes to get up on this table when I'm not working because this window is the best window in the house to watch you know, random people walking their dogs. So, hi Riley, please don't interrupt my stream. Or if you do, please do it quickly and then get out of here. Okay, he's checking things out. Um, I would like, to uh, work on some hats today. Well, maybe it'll be just one. Last week it was just one. I had this grand idea that I would finish three hats in the stream. Ha ha, that's crazy. Um, hi, Brian, welcome. <laughs> uh, I know there's at least three people here. Um, I'm gonna start working on one of these straw hats. And these hats, I talked about it last week. I'm working on a, a set of hats that are donation for a charity auction for a local nonprofit. Uh, sorry, the cat is really distracting. He's walking all over the bed, which I'm, my studio right now, I've had to set up in the upstairs of our home. And so I have a sewing room in the loft and I do uh, millinery work, especially blocking here on this table, which is in the guest bedroom. Um, so 
we do what we can. Anyway, um, I'm making these hats to donate to a charity auction, and they wanted one winter hat and one summer hat. So I, we looked last week at this hat that I made for um, the winter hat, which I like it like this. It's got these um, hand felted poppy flowers on it. And it's a felt hat, it's a winter hat. So this is the one that they're going to be auctioning for that, but they also would like a summer hat which um, here in the Northern Hemisphere, it's about to be fall and winter. So all of my colleagues, especially commercial milliners, are finishing up their felt collections for fall. So it's a little bit cognitive dissonance to start working on a straw hat um, for me, but I feel, I guess, solidarity with Southern Hemisphere milliners for whom they are heading into spring and summer and working in straw. So if there's anybody here from the Southern Hemisphere, um, I'm, I'm commensurate with you guys on the, the materials that I'm working in right now. And I'm uh, going against the trend of, of hat making here in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, I see some stuff in the chat. I really had hoped that I'd be able to negotiate that uh, tablet situation to monitor the chat because it's very hard for me. You can't adjust the text size in, in YouTube's chat. So um, so I have to squint and get up here really close and see what you guys are saying. Um, but it, it makes me um, recognize the, the, the disability of this poor eyesight that I have. Um, I agree, the flowers are so stunning. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. Um, as I mentioned last time, I did not hand felt the flowers myself. I bought them from a uh, felt flower artisan that was selling them in uh, the public market in the streets of Edinburgh, Scotland, when I was there um, on a summer vacation. Well, not vacation. It was graduate school, but it felt like a vacation because I was in Edinburgh. <laughs> so I have two possibilities for what I'm going to work on today. And the first one is this silver straw asymmetrical top hat style, which um, currently it has some trim pinned out on it, which you might be able to see the little yellow uh, heads of the pins that are, are securing it on here. And I pinned this trim out. This is, Zelda has a slippery head. It's hard to get things to stay on her without taping them down. Um, anyway. Uh, I pinned this out a couple of days ago, and that's how I sort of, when when I get to make the trim choices myself, that helps me to, to trim it out and then leave it in the studio and, and live with it and decide whether I truly do want to go ahead and secure it and make that be how the hat is trimmed, or if I think, ah, I'd like to try something else. And and that's my response to this. this has, I spent a couple of days with this trim on her head here in the studio, and it's fine. It's not to my taste, but I would like to try another trim story on it. Um, so project number one would be to take all the trim off of this silver hat and retrim it during this live studio time. Project number two is, project number two is this little hat, which is a blocked straw hat in green straw that I custom dyed myself, actually. I blocked this hat before the pandemic on a hat block that is owned by the theater where I work, Playmakers Repertory Company in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And so I blocked it and it, when I was done blocking it, it, it didn't have, the brim was not popped. So if you imagine this angle going down the other way, the brim was more of a down curved look and there wasn't a divot in the crown. So what I did after I blocked it, brought it home, finished the edge around a wire and sewed it down, um, was to, to pin it out on this canvas head block to have a little divot in this crown and to kick up the back, uh, the popped brim back here. And then I applied three coats of sizing. So this has been sized, but 
I need to take it off the block and see if that's sufficient. Does it need more sizing? I'm trying a new sizing technique. So it, it may still be too flimsy to finish it. Um, so let me know in the chat if you would rather see me work on the silver hat, which is retrimming and stuff, or the green hat, which is taking it off the block and seeing whether the sizing mystery has been successful or does it need still more stability before I finish trimming it. And this one, I do know what the trim is going to be. Um, so if you can type green or silver into the chat as to which one you'd like to see, um, I'll just let you decide because it's all the same to me. I could work on either one. Um, but this is the trim that's going to go on this little green one. Um, and it is, if you can see, this is an antique piece of ribbon, embroidered velvet ribbon, where the black part, that is, that is black velvet. And these rainbow squares on here are embroidered thread. So uh, I've created this little trim element and I need to stabilize it before I put it on the hat. And I'm thinking I want it to go asymmetrically. So it, it comes around the side like that um, is, is what I'm thinking. But I have to take the hat off the block and do a whole bunch of other stuff before I even get into that. Um, silver hat is my vote. Silver. Silver it is, I guess. Nobody wants to see the green hat. Well, you know what? Um, to be honest, I probably will get to both of them today because there's still 40 minutes left to this stream, uh, at least as I've planned it, an hour-long studio time. Um, and it's probably not going to take me 40 minutes to put the other trim collection onto this hat, um, and then I'll just move on to the green one. So if you look at what I, what I have on here now, is uh, a collection of fabric roses, which have been sprayed into with some, some gold spray paint to give them some, some depth. And then this beautiful sort of uh, celadon, celery green um, ribbon that is, uh, it's got an interesting woven edge fringe, scalloped edge fringe on it, if you can see that there. Um, that's, uh, one of the, the, the ribbon there is by a company called Mokuba that makes designer ribbons. And they are typically enormous, like way too expensive for me because I'm not, you know, operating on a, a mass production wholesale level. Um, but I think I mentioned this in my last stream because I was working with some other stuff that I got from this same sale because Mokuba in, they have a boutique in the garment district in New York city. And I, in non pandemic years, I typically go to New York for the summer and work in one of the Broadway shop, the shops that cater to Broadway and film and that are based in New York city. And when I go there, um, I also shop the garment district and, um, Typically, the costume shop manager at Playmakers will give me a dollar value limit of like, you can spend $250 this summer or whatever. Um, and I buy things for our costume shop on the company purchasing card, but I also buy things for myself because um, the deals are really good sometimes. And so this beautiful green Mokuba ribbon is one that I bought at, they have um, an end of season sale where the collections that has just come out the previous season, um, whatever the end of it is, the, the remaining spools, they sell a deep discount just to liquidate their inventory. And so this green was one of numerous partial spools of ribbon that I bought. And, you know, in, in ordinary times, this ribbon would probably be mm, maybe 12 or $15 a yard. And instead they were selling it a partial spool for $5 or $3. Um, so I got some really high end ribbons that summer, uh, uh, frequently several summers, I have gotten some really high end ribbons for really great deals. So um, that 
is where this came from. And this trim has been pinned out, like I said, on this hat, on this hat for through two or three days, I guess. And I don't hate it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that trim. That may be the trim that I decide to go with. Uh, but I'd like to try something else and see what I think about it. So this hat has been blocked from a straw hat body. So imagine just sort of a limp Jed Clampett hillbilly hat kind of shape in straw. And uh, you pull it over a hat block that is a piece of wood shaped like this. And um, then you stabilize it with something. In, um, in this case, it was uh, solvent-based sizing. So you paint on a few coats. And then when you take it off the block, it retains that shape. So this one, I have almost completed it. Like it's, it's got, see that label in the back? It's got my maker's label in the, the back of the hat. And it's really just left for me to decide how I want to trim it out. Um, this is a pretty uh, popular hat shape right now, this asymmetrical top hat. You, I have seen this shape a lot in uh, the context of church hats, racing hats, mother and grandmother of the bride. Um, it's, it's just crazy enough to be sophisticated, but it's not like those crazy Philip Tracy riding hats where it looks like a pancake has hit you in the side of the head and a bird got trapped in there, you know? <laughs> so, um, I need to get the trim that I'm thinking of using for a redecoration on this. have uh, some wide black grow grain, which also came from that fantastic Mokuba sale. Um, I have a handmade fabric flower from M&S Schmalberg, which is another business that I patronize in the summer in the garment district. They are the oldest handmade fabric flower company um, in the U.S. There was, when they started, they were one of 20, 30 hat flower or fabric flower making factories in the garment district. And they are the last ones clinging on now. Um, still family run, four generations of that family has been running the um, factory. But I'm my second concept of what this hat could be involves a different flower than those gold sprayed roses. And so this one, the Schmalberg one, which if, I don't know if you can see up close, it, it has a, a metallic sheen to it and the edges of the petals have been painted or dyed with a darker color and there's glittery bits involved. So this is a really, um, sparkly over the top kind of flower compared to these very uh, sedate kinds of flowers. So the woman that would wear the hat that this used to be trimmed with um, is a very different person from how I envision this new trend story being. And I also have, in case the, the pop of the uh, metallic blue is too much. I also have this handmade flower slash feather ornament because this is technically a flower. It's got petals and, and such, but incorporated into this flower are uh, different types of feathers, including these two stripped rooster feathers that, that have just the tip of the flues left on them. So this could be something kind of fun. Now, I am not a hat designer. I'm a theatrical milliner. And most of the time, that means that um, a costume designer provides our shop with a design rendering for each character that is being costumed by us. And I, as the milliner, look at what they've drawn for a hat and then interpret it in actuality. So 
that costume designer would go through, um, she might have uh, arrived with a box of flowers or they might go through our stock and choose some decor items and then give them to me and say, here you go. I want the hat to have these trims. So I'm almost never the person who is choosing the trims from scratch. Even if I choose options for that designer, they pick out what they want me to use. On occasion, I do have someone, uh, a designer perhaps that I've worked with uh, enough that we know we have congruent aesthetic tastes where they, uh, where they trust me enough to just say, oh, just make it look good. Um, and, and that's always fun when they do that. But most of the time, that's not happening for me. Um, and as such, I am not terribly confident in my ability to choose trims that are um, trim collections that are aesthetically cohesive. Um, I, I think I want this to go like that. So I'm just playing around with how to attach this um, antique black, wide black grow grain onto the hat. I think it wants to twist. Sometimes you have to let the material just do what it wants to do and not try to control it too much. Um, I find when I try to force it to do a thing that it really just doesn't want to do. Um, that's when it just looks contrived and ugly. Uh, what I'm finding here, so if you look at the shape of the top of this crown, it's like um, a conic section that gets wider from the head size opening to the tip. So it's like a, if you imagine a cone, an inverted cone, it's like a slice of it. And so trying to get a ribbon to go around that it actually needs to be curved. And I did press some curve into this grow grain before I began fiddling with it, um, but it still wants some, to do some folds and some creases. So um, I'm just allowing it to, to do that because that's how you get it to look graceful and not uh, slammed together and unattractive. So, Oh, I think I need to take. I need to stabilize this grow grain and then create like a sort of a makeshift bow. It won't really be a bow. It will look like a bow, um, but it'll just be uh, loops of ribbon that are, are rigged to appear that way. Let me quickly see if there's anything in the chat. They closed, I think East Coast. Oh, are you talking about Makuba closed? I did read that. Um, Emma Schmalberg is not closed though. Uh, they have a great social media presence thanks to uh, the guy who's currently um, a member of the, the family that is running it. Um, it's running great stuff on Instagram and um, Facebook. They have... Uh, a store on Facebook, you can buy the flowers on there. Um, and they have, you know, behind the scenes factory tours and such. He's really um, revolutionizing their online presence in a way that is pretty exciting to witness. Ooh, I kind of want this. Ha. negotiating what this ribbon is doing it's kind of um, it's kind of crazy but I think it'll work my pin cushion if you were here last week you remember um, that 
my um, former head of my graduate, the graduate program in which I teach made this uh, cupcake pin cushion as our Christmas presents one year, or holiday presents, not, some, not necessarily Christmas, could be Hanukkah, could be Yuletide, could be you don't even do presents in the winter or just because you're a nice person, whatever. Um, <laughs> anyway, okay. I think that I would need to hit this with some steam to get these loops to lay down a little better and I would need to trim away the excess of this um, ribbon right here but it's hard to see contrast on black isn't it um, I, I hope you can see that there's um, this new ornament, there's the band that comes around. I have two loops of the ribbon and then I have uh, a spray of the end of it that comes up like that. So that is one part of it. And then Zelda, work with me here, lady. The question is, take my pincushion out of the way. The question is, do I want this hat to be for, oh, I wish I had, I can stand up and provide a dark contrast to that so it doesn't just bleed into the background. Oh. So do you see that hat? Um, Do I want to finish it out so that that's the hat? Or my other choice is this black feather flower extravaganza. Um, which I worry that I don't have a good enough lighting in here to, to really allow you to see what this is like. Oh, you can see. So, the woman that would wear this hat in the summer is very different from the woman that would wear this hat in the summer. And they're both very different from the woman who would wear the roses and celery green, right? Um, I think that, uh, see, my tastes are, are very like, I love black, black and white, black and white and red, like the hat that I was working on last week that I called the Tim Burton hat. Um, I'm very into that sort of thing, aesthetically speaking for my own personal self. So none of these are the hat that I would wear if I uh, was making this hat for myself. I'm not, I'm making it for the charity auction. So I need to think about somebody who's likely to bid on a hat in a charity auction, what's gonna appeal to them as a summer hat. And so, I'm going to leave it like this for a couple of days because I like this. I personally like this one. I personally would wear this hat. Like, as a matter of fact, I will put this hat on right now. So I would wear this hat in my summer life to go to a friend's wedding or something. Oh, I might. I might wear it like this, though. Yeah, I think I would wear it like this. Anyway, um... But after I've spent some time with this hat on Zelda, then um, I may decide in a, a couple of days that in fact, I think that the person who is likely to bid on this hat would prefer either this handmade fabric flower um, in the metallic blue or the more, I don't wanna say grandmotherly, but Conservative. I, I would describe this trim story as a conservative, much more conservative 
than the feather flower fru that's happening right now. So I am going to move Zelda. If, if you have an opinion on which of those three trim uh, options that we've looked at since the stream or since I began working on this silver hat. Um, if you like one of them better than the rest, I, I would love the input in the chat. Uh, cast your vote because um, I I admit that I'm I'm more likely to design to, to make something that I want to wear and that my tastes are not so much everybody's tastes. So yeah, let me know which one you like. And now I guess I will start working on this one because we still have 20 minutes left to the stream. So this is a moment of truth, really. I have no idea if this is going to have been sufficiently sized enough. Hang on. I'm, my pillow got all wonky when I picked it up to create a backdrop for that silver hat. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm sitting on it weird. Um, so I have no idea when I remove these pins from this hat, uh, whether the sizing that I uh, coated it with has been sufficient for it to retain the shape or whether um, I'm not so much worried about the back of the brim losing its pop because pretty much that's a, a surface tension sort of, of thing and there's a wire stabilizer here. So once I pop that up, it's gonna stay up. What I'm concerned about is whether this divot that I've blocked into the brim or into the tip of the crown rather is going to stay there or when I pop it off the block, is it just going to pop back into either being flat or horribly invert itself into a sort of a, a roll-on deodorant shape, which is would be extremely undesirable. So I hope that's not what happens right now as I'm taking this off. Well, it retained the divot, so that's exciting. Um, I love this hat style, I have to say. Um, I've done several hats on this hat block for Playmakers Repertory Company. And I, I think the one that I enjoyed making the most was um, the hat body was, a. it started life as a white Toyo straw, which is twisted paper straw, has a very coarse weave to it. So, you know, in theatrical costuming, I use Toyo straw hat bodies um, the same way I would use raffia hat bodies where you want to see this big coarse woven straw, usually for sort of rusticated looking hats, um, for characters who are working class or uh, farmers working out in the sun. Um, that's the type of hat that I would normally make out of that. And the, the hat that I'm talking about that I took a white Toyo straw hat body, um, was initially for uh, Pride and for a character in Pride and Prejudice, um, not the Bennett's mother, but uh, some woman that shows up and she's like a society lady and she's wearing a dress that is the fashions of yesteryear, so it's not a Regency gown, and um, they they wanted to to see the weave of the straw, so I took this Toyo straw, I dyed it gray to match her dress and uh, blocked this hat shape, blocked it on this hat block. Um, and then we took the, I took the fabric of her dress and created a ruched underbrim. So you saw this lovely wrinkled change, uh, oh, what's the word? Taffeta, a oh, cross-woven taffeta. It's cross-weave black and gray taffeta. So it really looks metallic and beautiful. You catch the light, great on stage. And so I had this lovely ruched, taffeta brim underneath, under brim here, and um, use that same ruche taffeta to do a, a band that started here, went up around it, and then crossed over down to here and went into the binding on the edge of the hat, which was the same taffeta. And that hat was so, so beautiful when I made it. Um, but in its life, it later was it got pushed into uh, put stored in a 
uh, hat drawer in our costume storage after that show closed, as you do, um, put into a straw hats container. And that container was overstuffed, let's just say that. Uh, so it got crushed. I mean, a Toyo straw is paper straw. So unlike, like this is parasisol. And if you crush this one, chances are it's gonna splinter and get a hole. And then it definitely is a poor person's hat. Um, but that Toyo straw, it got sat on basically. I mean, not literally, but I mean, it was smushed flat. Like imagine if I sat on this hat, what it would look like, that's what it looked like. And it got the designer, I think the designer for um, a production we did of My Fair Lady pulled it for Eliza Doolittle, Eliza Doolittle in the portion of the show where she is still a, a poor flower seller in the streets of London, still has her Cockney accent. So of course she wants to be fashionable but she doesn't have a huge amount of money. She's selling flowers out of a basket. Um, and so the fact that the, the hat had been squished and was not really restorable to its original beauty was a plus in that circumstance. So it was fun to see that hat have two lives, I guess. So back to this hat though. Um, now that I've sat here holding it, while I've been telling you that story about the other version of the hat, um, Tactile uh, analysis uh, tells me that I, my sizing experiment has worked. I think that to be fully uh, satisfied with the level of sizing that has happened on this, I think I would like to do another layer of the stiffener on the inside. Now that I know that my divot is going to stay and I've popped my back brim, um, I, I want to do at least one, maybe two coats of interior sizing just to reinforce it from the other side of the material. So I'm going to go do that here. But first I want to, I want to show you what my sizing is. This is an experiment I've been running for, I guess, ah, Maybe a month. Ever since I started digitizing my millinery class for the fall semester. Um, so I s started that back in May of this year because I knew at the beginning of the summer, at the end of last semester, I knew that my fall class was going to be online delivery because in the drama department, our, our university wanted to um, have some in-person classes, but in the drama department, when you talk about classes that you ideally teach in person, something like a movement class for actors where they're learning the Alexander technique and they need to be able to, to have their professor touch them and form their body to correctly practice the movement, being in person for that is more important than, or, or more necessary, I guess, than learning millinery techniques. And I was pretty sure that I could digitize the lectures and, and um, come up with ways to communicate information about millinery processes because I know that companies, uh, institutions like hatacademy.com, so they, they only have online courses. Well, they might have some in person, but they, they're, they have an online course delivery system teaching things like blocking hats with cinema straw or carving your own hat block. And I thought, well, you know, they are very successful at teaching this online. So I'm going to, I'm going to do my millinery class online because I can and, and allow my colleagues to have access to, uh, to, uh, to in-person teaching for courses that they feel is more necessary to be physically present there. Um, but luckily, my, my students are able to, in staggered shifts with reduced occupancy, uh, get into the millinery studio to use things like perhaps the block that this hat was made on. Nobody, they presented those blocking projects this morning. Nobody used this block, but they could have if they wanted to because it was there for them to use when they are in the studio. So it's not ideal. Nothing is ideal in this uh, pandemic circumstance, but... I think we've come up with the best possible solution uh, to allow them the most access to the space and the equipment safely, as safely as you can in this pandemic circumstance. But back to this hat, I'm digressing. Um, 
I've been doing this hat sizing experiment ever since May because in searching YouTube for existing videos that might already uh, be out there illustrating best practices in millinery construction techniques, I found lots of stuff from traditional masculine hat, si hat styles, uh, people who, hatters who make, you know, cowboy hats and fedoras and so forth where they have documented their processes excellently. And, and that's, that's still a very viable avenue of employment in hat making is to make and refurbish those styles of hats. So I found a channel, well, I found in numerous channels, but I found one channel from a hat shop. I think it's a chain of, of hat shops, uh, JJ Hat in New York City or at least the guy who was making the videos was located in Manhattan. And he was demonstrating things like how to resize a fedora that's gotten floppy and, and not as crisp as it once was. And, you know, and he, he was using a proprietary can of spray hat sizing, which I'm old enough to remember when Manny's Millinery Supply in the Garment District sold aerosol hat sizing. And I think Manhattco was another one that sold a, 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 a brand of hat size, their own brand of hat sizing, and it was an aerosol spray. And the label was always sort of like, looked like they did it on a home printer, which at the time was like dot matrix. <laughs> so JJ, the, the, the hatter making the videos for JJ, had sprayed his hat sizing in the fedora. And then, you know, let me demonstrate with this one. He sprayed it all in there and then he wafted it around to get the sizing uh, solvent to evaporate. And I was like, ah, oh, I wonder what he's using because an aerosol hat sizing would be great to have, but like he's just using it, no respirator, no ventilation hood. He's in some tiny little shop in Manhattan. Like either he's going to go crazy from breathing at hat sizing so much every day pretty quickly, or it's got to be something that is not harmless, but less harmful. Well, so I looked through the channel, uh, looked through his channel for other videos and see if I could find out more about that sizing. And sure enough, there was one that was called the secret behind our aerosol hat sizing. And I was like, all right, here's my answer. So it was like a 20 second video where he peels the label off of it. And what was under there was this. It was a can of Rave Mega Hold hairspray. And he was like, yeah, that's just what we use. And I'm like, really? Really? Rave Mega Hold hat size? <laughs> Rave Mega Hold has hat stiffener? Um, but then I started thinking about it. And I'm like, that's not actually as crazy as it seems. Because it's made to hold hair fibers in whatever configuration you style them into. Like, rat it up big bouffant hairstyles of the 60s or um, spiky, crazy uh, bangs from the 80s or whatever. Like, this is good for that. So I thought, well, I mean, what is wool felt? But a bunch of, hat fi a bunch of hair fibers that are felted together. So if it'll work on your hair, maybe it does work on wool felt. So... Back when I first watched that video, I tried, I had a floppy fedora, felt fedora, sprayed a couple of, of coats of this on the outside and a couple of coats on the inside. And sure enough, it wound up stable again. So then I decided, let's try it on straw. And I, that's how I pinned this out. That, that's why I pinned this out initially to have the crown divot and the back popped was so that I could spray it with a few coats of rave. So it's had three coats of hairspray on the exterior of the hat. And now it's, it's quite nicely sturdy. Like I do want to put a couple coats on the inside. Um, but, but my, my sense is that it's, it's working as well as it did on the felt on the straw. 
And I did have, um, like I said, my, my graduate students presented blocked hat projects today. And um, one of them, actually, they're an undergraduate, but one of my students did use hairspray on their blocked hat and um, thought that it worked pretty well. Um, I, they, they were kind of unsure about its floppability. And so I encouraged them to do a couple of more coats on the interior of the hat, but um, they had some success with it. So we're, we're pretty set on it being okay for being better than okay. It being um, a, a good replacement for the solvent based sizing that gives you cancer um, on a felt hat body. And so now I'm, I'm suspecting that it will be similarly adequate on the straw. Now, what I'm gonna do is pop into my restroom and spray this and then leave it in there for a bit because, because there's an exhaust fan in there and I don't want to smell hairspray in here for the remaining mm, eight minutes of this stream. So, I'm gonna leave you here and I'm gonna warn, uh, cause it's only gonna take like 20 seconds. Um, but I'm also going to, to offer a caveat that Riley, my cat is sitting literally right here. And it is possible that as soon as I get up to go do this, that he's gonna leap on this table. And if so, then I guess there's something exciting to watch. So I'm gonna go size this really quick and I will be back to talk about the trim that's gonna go on it. Riley, don't you get up there, buddy. Well, if you get up there, don't mess anything up. Oh, you're being good. I thought you'd get up there and eat a flower. I see he did not, in fact, jump up here to mess everything up. Um, good boy. So I just went in there, sprayed a new coat of sizing. You might hear the exhaust fan in the background because even though hairspray is something that you're intended to spray around your face onto your own hair, and of course you breathe the smell of it, it's alcohol based. So then that, so that's the sizing that, or, or that's the, the solvent for the sizing. Um, I still don't think that it's great to just have that lingering in the air of the house. So I turn on that exhaust fan so that it can waft away the remaining scent of hairspray. And now I've got six minutes less to the stream and I'd like to talk a little bit about this piece of trim that's going to go onto that green hat. Actually, first, let me let me take that back. Um, I do want to say that, especially my student Fitz, who used the hat size, who used the hairspray as hat sizing on their blocked hat project, um, noted that it left a, a residue and felt like perhaps they had done too heavy a coat and second and third coats too quickly. So it built up on the surface of the felt rather than impregnating the wool fibers. And I, I agree, I think that they're analyzing that correctly. I think that, and, and, and for myself, I had that happen on the very first hat that I used it on. And since then I have restricted myself to very light coats of hat sizing, or hat size, light coats of hairspray and then leaving it to fully dry in between each application. So you don't get that kind of crustiness, I guess. It, it kind of looked, it, it was definitely uh, skating on the surface of their hat instead of fully impregnating the material. And that's what we want. Um, it's less of an issue, I think, with straw because the, the plant fibers that that hat body are, is woven from are less permeable than wool hair. Um, so the, the hairspray is 
sticking a slick piece of straw to another slick piece of straw and it it doesn't need to soak down in there. So I feel like I'm less likely to get that sort of strange surface gumminess, uh, cloudiness, surface cloudiness on the straw as um, I don't need to be as careful as with the wool. But still, I'm, I'm, I'm restricting myself in these experiments to light coats that fully dry in between each other. And so far it's working quite well. So moving on to this awesome piece of trim here, which like I said at the beginning of the stream is composed of uh, this is an antique piece of ribbon that I found in a, a box of all kinds of random stuff when my, my aunt passed it away maybe eight years ago now, I guess. And I inherited her textile collection because she was an antique textile dealer, which sounds a lot more glamorous than it actually was. Basically, she would go to estate sales and she would buy lots that consisted of the contents of sewing rooms. So they would have doilies, fabric yardage, quilts in progress, trims, laces, spools of thread, all kinds of crap. And then she would go through it, sort it out, salvage what can be salvaged, and then repackage the rest of it into lots that she would sell on eBay and in flea markets. So anyway, I inherited all that stuff when she passed away. And this ribbon was in a big bag of other types of ribbon that were from, you know, ye oldie tinies. And it is a, feels like a cotton velveteen, really, velvet, black velvet ribbon that has been embroidered with little squares of colored thread to create this pattern. It's got a zigzag pattern to it. And to create this piece of trim, I have carefully manipulated, I've tied it in knots, a knot in each end basically, but the careful manipulation of that ribbon to make each knot be mm -hmm. a sort of a, a, a flat pentagon creates this piece of trim, the knot at each end oriented around symmetrically this motif in the middle. So in order to put this on the hat, I need to stabilize it so that it, the knots don't come untied and it doesn't just fall apart into mush. So I need, um, I'm thinking that I will use black thread and stitch, not in the ditch, but I guess stitch right along the border between the velvet ground ribbon and the um, embroidered central motif to, to stitch this down through and through so these knots don't come out. Um, at least that's my plan. Now I see that basically my stream time, my open studio time has come to an end. I uh, want to thank everybody who has joined me today. Um, I really got to figure out why Streamlabs is not letting me connect and it may be something as simple as like my Wi-Fi sucks today because Mickey told us in the class that the best way to do this is with an Ethernet cable and I do not have one up here. I guess maybe I should speak to my partner about whether I could get an Ethernet cable up here. Um, but that's a problem for another time. Thank you so much for joining me for the stream today. And uh, I guess we'll figure out sometime before next week I'll figure out which one of these I uh, am going to stabilize. Thank you for coming, Athena. I appreciate seeing you here. I'm glad to know that at least one of my students showed up and was uh, willing to speak in the chat. That's fantastic. I hope more of them are able to join or if you are here, because I can't see who else. Oh, Alex, yay, Alex is here too. Um, also another one of my students. So I, I hope this has been at least helpful or interesting. Some of the, the stories that get told about the things that you use when you create hats or philosophy of, of making and pinning out trim and so forth. Um, next week, I'm hoping I will have made a decision on this silver top hat and 
can finish it up. See, I don't know which of these hats is going to be the one that I donate to that charity auction because I, I don't know how they're going to turn out. Like one may be vastly better than the other and I don't want to donate a crummy hat to charity auction. I would like it to be a beautiful hat. So we'll see how they both turn out. Um, I will have gotten farther uh, on this green hat. We'll probably be stabilizing the trim on, on the hat. Um, and something to think about if, if you plan to join me next time, I'm not sure how I'm going to attach, how I think the wearer should attach that green hat to the head because you can't just balance it on your hair. It will just slide off or blow away. So I've thought about it, mounting it on a, an elastic band that goes around the back of the head. That works pretty good. Thought about on the stage, we would do horsehair loops so you could put wig pins or hair pins through it to pin it to the actor's hair or wig. I don't know that that is a good choice for everyday life though, because unless you work in the theater, chances are you've never seen a horsehair. If you're here from Britain, I'm talking about crinoline. Chances are you've never seen a horsehair or crinoline loop in a hat for a hat pin. And we don't really use hat pins and hair, hair pins as much as we once did fashion wise. So I don't want to mount it on something that's going to confuse the buyer in how they're supposed to wear it. So that's why I'm thinking an elastic band is a good option. I thought about a possible um, combs that, that would be stitched into the hat that could go into the wearer making pin curls, but that's, that's a level of hairstyling that I don't know that the average person has these days either. So unless the buyer has a, a very uh, coarsely textured hair, they're not gonna, comb is not going to be very effective if they have slippery hair. So I want it to be something that anybody could wear depending on who buys it. Um, and so I thought about a headband or a barrette that they could, if it's on a headband, then you put the headband on and the hat is just wherever it's oriented takes some of the adjustment freedom away from the hat wearer. But the average person now doesn't have a lot of creativity about how they're gonna put a hat on their head. Most of them, I'll tell you, even actors, you would think actors would be better than most people, but in fact, even actors will put a hat on and they'll put it right on the back of their head like this, as if they're Huckleberry Finn, Tom Sawyer painting a fence. And if their character is to be, you know, a, a, a rural character, a countrified character, an innocent, a naive character, then yeah, you do want to wear it like that. But in fact, you know, this hat, I want to wear it like this if it's my hat, right? And so if I put that green hat on a headband, then I'm making the choice for how that person who owns that, who buys the hat is going to wear it. And I'm not comfortable doing that. I, I believe that hats should be able to be worn a number of different ways. And um, I always put hats on backwards just to see how it looks. And usually I like it better than how it's indicated that I'm supposed to wear it. So Anyway, I'm digressing. I'm going far past the time that I said I would end this stream. Thank you so much for joining me. If you come back next week, I may be finishing these hats or I may go back to the Tim Burton Finn. We'll just see what has happened in the intervening time. Or I might start something new. I have a new hat block that I can't wait to create something on. Um, so it might be a total surprise. Anyway, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate everybody's comments in the chat. And I've loved having guests here in my studio today. I'm really looking forward to this stream as a, a regular practice. It keeps me on task with projects that otherwise don't really have concrete due dates. That's unfortunate that the theater is, the good thing about being a theatrical milliner is like, it has to be done by opening night the end and something like this like they're being kind of loosey-goosey about a due date on it and I'm like no please tell me like even if the due date is January 4th like if I know when it has to be done I actually plan a little better 
anyway, I'm running on. Thanks so much. And I'll see you next week. Bye.